Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, August 4th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, has Obama just declared war on Syria? Well, President Obama giving the Pentagon the green light to defend U.S.-backed rebels in Syria. Now, under the new rules of engagement, the fighters trained and armed by the U.S. would have the support of airstrikes if they're attacked by Islamic extremists or Syrian government forces. Then, men allegedly amass a arsenal to combat Jade Helm. And Democratic supporters of Planned Parenthood refuse to watch the expose videos. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Described as the most mind-boggling spin possible, Planned Parenthood is now claiming that it helps prevent abortions. In response to moves by Republicans in Congress to defund the organization, which receives over half a billion dollars per year in taxpayer funds, Planned Parenthood tweeted the following, Republicans indignant about abortion are trying to destroy a government program that helps prevent 345,000 abortions a year. To which one person responded, an organization claims it is preventing abortions while executing almost 400,000 abortions in 2013. And of course, this latest push happened when groups and organizations connected to Planned Parenthood were caught on video chopping up body parts and having individuals say that they wanted to use the proceeds of said body parts to purchase Lamborghinis. You can find more reports on Infowars.com. While speaking at the Young African Leaders Initiative Summit in Washington, D.C. yesterday, the president decried this practice of organ harvesting. No, not that organ harvesting. During the Q&A session, uh, a young Kenyan woman asked the president to address the epidemic of ritualistic albino organ harvesting that's taking place in Africa. And he went on this tirade saying that it's just foolish traditions and it's infuriating and he has no patience for it. Now, ironically, these recently published undercover videos showing Planned Parenthood harvesting baby body parts have received absolutely zero condemnation from the Obama administration. And we, I, you know, I don't know if it's just that he would wants to have cognitive dissonance or you know plausible deniability because I don't even think he's watched any of the videos according to the White House press secretary. Now, a fifth video has surfaced showing a Planned Parenthood official haggling with uh, undercover reporters posing as these potential buyers about the sale of intact specimens. So that is whole bodies of babies. And the video shows Melissa Farrell, who's the director of research for Planned Parenthood Gulf Coast. She's talking about how an abortion can be performed in a specific way to ensure intact fetal cadavers. So once again, we have a, another official on camera talking about altering the procedure, confirming once again, several times, that they can alter the procedure to meet a client's needs. We're going to potentially be able to have some that will be more or less intact and then right. some that will not be. Right. So, and we, but it's something that we can look at exploring how right. we can make that happen right. so we okay. have a higher chance. Um, it'll probably um, also require a little bit of input from the doctors because the mm -hmm. doctors are the ones asking, asking right. yeah. directly doing that and, you know, when it matters, you know, in the, in the cases of when mm -hmm. it's mattered and the physicians yeah. also need an intact specimen, they can make it happen. Right. So we oh, just okay. need to figure out how right. okay. um, that we can do this, you know, under, um, you know, our project needs. If that provider is needing to change the technique a little bit, and and I know I'm going against my side of this, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm okay with no. I want you to be paid per specimen, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and rather than oh here just ship this off no mm -hmm. this is what we're looking for and mm -hmm. if you can do that and it compensates you mm -hmm. and financially that's helping mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. to grow your clinic yeah I'm willing to do that mm -hmm. I, yeah and so if we alter our process mm -hmm. and we are able to obtain intact fetal cadavers then we can make it part of the budget that any dissections are this and splitting the specimens into different shipments is mm. this. I mean, that's, 
It's all just a matter of line items. Mm -hmm. So regardless of how you feel, the fact that she's admitting to altering the procedure and that that's something they can do, it's just a matter of line items, that is illegal. But we're hearing no outcry from the president. In fact, a judge who was appointed by President Obama granted a temporary restraining order against the release of any further Planned Parenthood videos that were shot in a particular uh, abortion facility in an attempt to conceal Planned Parenthood's practices. Now, we already know that Congress is guilty of passing bills without even reading them. They tell us that all the time. They got to pass it to find out what's in it. Uh, but this effort to defund Planned Parenthood is no different. The legislation, which was authored by Senator Joni Ernst, it fell short by just seven votes of the 60 that were needed for this bill to progress. But it turns out when they were asked about it, several Democrats haven't even bothered to watch the videos that have been released by the Center for Medical Progress. Uh, before yesterday's vote, Representative Alan Grayson bizarrely called the video doctored, which is you know the same talking point that's been repeated by the White House Press Secretary Josh Ernest, he actually called these videos fraudulent. And his evidence, Planned Parenthood told him. So that's what he told reporters. But he went even further in his efforts uh, defending Planned Parenthood's ethical standards. Uh, based on the public comments of Planned Parenthood, who has indicated that uh, the views that are represented in the video are entirely inconsistent uh, with, the, with that organization's policies and with the high ethical standard that they live up to. Would, you, would it be unfair to say that you're simply taking your um, talking points from Planned Parenthood on these videos? Well, I, again, I guess I, I would suggest that you um, consult with Planned Parenthood for the details of their policies. Uh, and I'm merely repeating what I've seen that they've said uh, and has been reported publicly about what they've said. Uh, but I'm certainly not the only person to arrive at this conclusion. There are a number of others uh, who have taken a look at those videos and um, raised significant doubts about their authenticity based on the way that they were edited. Uh, and they certainly are consistent with the frequently stated policy uh, of Planned Parenthood. And I think that's why uh, many, many people who've taken a look at this situation have arrived at uh, the same conclusion and described the videos the same way that I have. Well, the Snowden revelations have confirmed the existence of the Echelon surveillance system. For the last 30 years or so, this has just been a big conspiracy theory. The government has lied about this indis indiscriminate surveillance program for years. Echelon is a global system for the interception of private and commercial communications. And it reportedly was first planned with the establishment of the national security state in 1947. In 1988, the British investigative journalist Duncan Campbell wrote an article titled, Somebody's Listening. And he wrote that for the statesman and it revealed the existence of Echelon. 27 years later now, he is vindicated. Campbell says, in December 2014, I asked fellow Scottish journalist and Intercept reporter Ryan Gallagher to check Snowden's documents. Was there evidence of Echelon? And uh, after they checked those documents, they discovered a number of NSA and GCHQ documents confirming what a whistleblower had discovered 27 years previously. And you can read that article in full at Infowars.com. It will tell you all about it. But once again, another conspiracy theory becoming conspiracy fact. But even with all this exposure of all the mass surveillance going on, our privacy is still being threatened. Corporations and data brokers are really pushing for CISA to be passed. Uh, but surprisingly, Homeland Security is warning that it could sweep away Internet users' privacy. So CISA grants broad latitude to tech companies and data brokers and anyone with a web-based data collection. Uh, they can mine user information and, they sh and then share it with appropriate federal entities, which then those federal entities have permission to share it throughout the government. So frankly, why is Homeland Security against this, first of all? It doesn't really explain that in that article at all, why Homeland Security would be putting out the warning to Americans that their privacy is being threatened. But we know why data brokers are, of course, anxious to get CISA passed because they don't want to lose the ability uh, to sell all of our user information and to, and to uh, license that data as a very lucrative practice. Uh, but the language that's in this info sharing bill carves a giant hole in privacy laws. Um, it's going to allow tech companies like Google and Facebook to hand over 
massive amounts of user data to the government and there's no legal process for that whatsoever. Now, the amount of information that's floating free within the federal government, that could include uh, credit card histories, lists of goods purchased, and your healthcare records. And we've already seen you know, how good the government is at maintaining private information, um, you know, keeping it from being vulnerable to hackers. Uh, but now the NSA and the FBI, they're already tapped into the internet's back door. So we don't need any sweeping cybersecurity legislation that almost, um, you know, encourages companies to hand over Americans' data to these government agencies because uh, they can hand it over without any legal repercussions from people who might feel that their private data has been threatened. And of course, they are voting on all of this while everyone is worried about a lion. Okay, it's, you always, when you see the mainstream media just really pushing these insane stories that have nothing really to even do with America, everyone's like worried about this lion. They're definitely doing something in Congress, so you should always pay attention. But that's not all. The Obama White House has also just declared war on Syria, and nobody has even paid any attention. Remember the massive freak out back in 2013 of what seemed like an imminent announcement of US military action in Syria? It seemed as though Obama was hours, even minutes away from committing US forces to a conflict that many feared could start World War III. Good afternoon, everybody. Ten days ago, the world watched in horror as men, women, and children were massacred in Syria in the worst chemical weapons attack of the 21st century. And now's the time to show the world that America keeps our commitments. Only a last minute about turn saved the day and everyone breathed a huge sigh of relief. Well, Obama has just basically declared war on Syria and hardly anyone even noticed. Well, President Obama giving the Pentagon the green light to defend U.S.-backed rebels in Syria. Now, under the new rules of engagement, the fighters trained and armed by the U.S. would have the support of airstrikes if they're attacked by Islamic extremists or Syrian government forces. So if the rebels make it to Damascus and are about to attack the presidential palace, the White House just authorized U.S. fighter jets to bomb the presidential palace. How is that not a declaration of war? ISIS is wreaking havoc all over the region, killing Christians and Muslims en masse, but the Obama White House is still preoccupied with targeting the Syrian military, which is the major force in the region fighting ISIS. Meanwhile, our so-called ally, Turkey, is buying huge quantities of oil from ISIS and bombing Kurdish soldiers who are fighting ISIS in northern Iraq. The Israeli military is also providing aid to Syrian rebels, many of whom have gone on to join Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups and ISIS itself. What the hell is going on? Why is the United States and its allies targeting people who are killing ISIS? Why are we following the same disastrous policy that we saw in Libya where rebel groups supported by NATO in the overthrow of Gaddafi went on to form the leadership of ISIS. Why are we doubling down on a failed foreign policy, supporting terrorists in a bid to topple sovereign governments that has spawned a humanitarian catastrophe and a jihadist ideology that has led to the massacre of tens of thousands? Is this really about fighting ISIS? Or is it about exploiting the threat posed by ISIS to achieve the long-term geopolitical goal of toppling the governments of Syria and Iran? And how many more thousands of innocent lives will be lost in the pursuit of that goal? How many more Christians and Muslims will be slaughtered for refusing to submit to ISIS's draconian reign of terror? How many more gay people will be thrown off buildings? How many more women stoned to death? How long before Democrats and Republicans, Liberals and Conservatives, unite to demand an end to this insanity? To stand in unison against the military-industrial complex and say this stops right now. Enough is enough. 
Coming up later in the show, experts warn that sex with robots is going to be the new normal by 2070. Can't wait for that. But first, Joe Biggs is going to be joining me in studio with a Jade Helm update. Stick around. On its face, this should be illegal. You know, we bring everyone together to the table here in Huntington Park so we can make sure that we are sharing the same vision. Huntington Park, California Councilman Johnny Pineda announced that he will be appointing two illegal aliens as city commissioners. The two illegal aliens just happened to have worked on Pineda's campaign. Pineda countered, claiming that the illegal council members would not be paid due to federal prohibition and that they would not be able to determine city policy. This is an advisory position for them to, you know, give city council recommendation. Yeah. They're not going to be, you know, passing any policy at all. You know, at the end, you know, we do have the final word. We're sending the wrong message to other cities that you can be illegal and you can come and work for a city. And apparently, Pineda believes that his historic decision is legal and represents the community at large. The Hispanic mayor of Huntington Park backed Pineda up, and why not? California has been transformed. Back in 2014, Hispanics outgrew the white population as their numbers rose to 15 million, surpassing 14.92 million whites. And this isn't the first time this has happened in California. Southgate, California appointed Jesus Miranda, an illegal alien, as an advisor to its Council on Housing Development last month. Police departments hiring immigrants as officers. Yeah, they hire illegals as officers, actually. That's been coming out for years. Uh, you can read that. USA Today. That's how it is in England. I've had members of Parliament on from England where they report that over half the CPS workers that take your kids uh, don't even speak English and aren't from the country. They come from mainly Eastern Bloc, they found. Uh, folks that grew up under totalitarianism, they're, they're hiring them because there's a second wave of uh, people out of Eastern Europe. Not the first wave wanted to flee tyranny. The new wave just wants better jobs, and they're the socialists that stayed behind, and boy, do they make good masters over the indigenous. This is what a slow invading horde looks like. Breitbart recently reported, under current federal policy, the U.S. issues green cards to approximately one million new legal permanent residents every single year. If Congress does not pass legislation to reduce the number of green cards issued each year, the U.S. will legally add 10 million or more new permanent immigrants over the next 10 years. A block of new permanent residents larger than populations of Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina combined. And why are these numbers so staggering? Breitbart continues, the post-World War II boom decades of the 1950s and 1960s averaged together less than 3 million green cards per decade, or about 285,000 annually. Due to lower immigration rates, the total foreign-born population in the United States dropped from about 10.8 million in 1945 to 9.7 million in 1960 and 9.6 million in 1970. Now the floodgates are wide open. As ICE documents revealed earlier this year that another 30,000 criminal illegals were released into the U.S. following the previous 36,000 released in 2013 that are currently roaming our streets, randomly committing DUIs, drug offenses, kidnappings, carjackings, aggravated assault, and murder. Putting it all into perspective, can you imagine? the hubris it would take to install illegal Americans into the city councils of Mexico in order for more illegal Americans to overtake the Mexican community while committing heinous criminal acts in their country. John Bound for Infowars.com. Rob Dew reporting for InfoWars.com and InfoWars Nightly News. Uh, I wanted to show you guys a view of my room. This is right inside my little hotel room. It's basically three very small apartment rooms. And uh, we get served a little breakfast in the morning. Not extravagant, but you can't beat the view. I mean, if you want history, look no further than the Roman Colosseum. It was began being built in 72 AD uh, by the Emperor Vespasian. It was completed about eight years later 
by the Emperor Titus and it held, they say, between 50 to 80,000 people. They had gladiatorial matches, sea battles, they would flood the water, flood water in the bottom of the, uh, of the Colosseum and do naval battles. They had famous land battles, they would do hunts with animals, just plain old executions. And they'd even do some drama every once in a while, but what people really liked was the killing. They loved the gladiatorial events. And as Rome fell further and further into decay, they would have more and more and more events. They would have them for like 200 straight days of just killing people, Christians, having gladiatorial, gladiatorial contests, and uh, you name it, they were doing it. And it was all to keep the public distracted on what was really going on. So you could say that this is a monument to the uh, biggest distraction on earth right here. And you can see they have scaffolding built on the sides. They're uh, doing some repair work. I think what they actually do is drill holes and then insert concrete in there to keep to keep it from falling apart. And uh, but there's only there only seems to be a scaffold on one side. <clears throat> but back to the distraction. This is their number one tourist destination in Rome. Even today, people flock to it, um, and it is super hot out there. Let me tell you it is Texas level heat. The sun feels a little hotter it, out here. It, it, uh, it really just burns your skin. And uh, I was out there for a good three, four hours today. I'll show you what, what I look like now. I'm, I'm a little tired, a little sweaty, but uh, you know, I felt I had to do this report. I just put up one on uh, the Alex Jones channel. I'm um, talking about a museum complex that I went to and discovered that they were using it to promote eugenics they were trying to they distract you with this beautiful architecture and, and these crazy shapes that are buildings and and inside while some of the stuff may be okay they have an agenda in there and it's to promote eugenics and race cleansing and that's something that we always have to be on the lookout and at least recognize it when it's there go back to the Colosseum there's a, uh, there's a traffic 24 hours driving by here but uh, I don't mind. It was great waking up in the morning and seeing the sun rise on the Colosseum. And it was quite a trip to get here. And there's, there's ruins in the back. You can, it's, this is the whole forum area. You could go, there's acres and acres of, uh, of old ruins. It's a really interesting area. I, I can't wait to explore more of it. But getting back to, to Italy and how it's doing on our investigation. Uh, when we landed, we were waiting for our luggage. It took almost two hours for the luggage to arrive from the plane. I thought that was a little extreme, but it just goes to show you that they probably don't have enough workers working the luggage carriers. Uh, I went to get a coffee. It pops down and water comes out and then a spoon. A cup came out too, but no coffee. You know, they're just not, and there's no out of order sign. I saw three other people use that coffee machine and not get any coffee. Uh, and you look at the reports that the Mafia has infiltrated the local Roman government, um, mainly uh, through weird contracts, uh, overbidding contracts, so they're just siphoning money out of the central government, so then there's no money for things like trash pickup. Although, for me, from where I've been, I haven't seen anything too um, out of the ordinary. Uh, no overflowing giant trash bins or anything, I haven't seen that, but... Um, I will report on that if I do see it. But I talked to a guy last night, right when I got in. He was uh, he was my roommate. He actually stayed up out front waiting for me because they knew I was going to be a little late. And uh, he he is uh, Italian, and uh, you know I said, well, how how is your government doing? There's trash collection going on right now. I said, how how's the economy? He's the economy. He said it's uh, it's scheisse, as they say in German. Um, I said, is it worse than Greece's? He said, much worse than Greece's. We have way more debt. Um, we can't pay it back. And, and he said, there's just so much corruption here that he, he couldn't believe it. And uh, he said, the reason they don't have bailouts and stuff here is because they know, uh, or more bailouts, is that they know Italians aren't going to follow the rules anyway. He said, Italians don't follow the law. There's an old saying about that. that and uh, that was coming from an Italian, not from me. Uh, but it was interesting. He said they were much worse off than Greece. It was uh, as I was pulling my luggage in, and it was about 
1 30 in the morning so i didn't pull out my camera and interview him but he does live around here there's a uh, centurion probably going to come out and pose for pictures probably uh it's probably his sole employment right there is dressing up like that guy and and going out into uh into the coliseum grounds to do battle Dan Badandi, Infowars.com at the Rhode Island Ferry Festival and it is August of 2015 and the presidential races are heating up already. So we're going to ask Rhode Islanders who their choice is for president for 2016 and also ask parents if they're concerned about the new law that mandates all children to be vaccinated prior to entering school this year. Hey, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Enjoying the Ferry Festival? I'm so excited there's one here. <laughs> Now, in 2016, your pick for U.S. president, uh, Hillary, Jeb Bush, Donald Trump, or somebody else? Uh, Hillary Clinton, all the way. I'm looking at Joe Biden. I hear that he's th thinking of uh, throwing his hat in the ring. Probably Hillary. Hillary? Well, I'm a Republican, so I would have to go with someone on the Republican bill. Like Jeb Bush or Donald Trump? Yeah. Not Donald Trump, so let's go Jeb. Jeb okay. Somebody else. Uh, Marco Rubio. I would say Hillary, but I'm looking for someone to come up. And uh, what has Hillary Clinton done for this country to make you want to vote for her? Um, well, uh, I thought she was fantastic Secretary of State, and probably one of my favorite things that her and Chelsea do as a fairy <laughs> is their things for the animal activist, for the elephant and the ivory trade and things like that. But um, for more a political um, way, I think she'll help get um, fair pay for women and uh, hopefully bump up the minimum wage. Well, she has a lot of experience being, you know, the Secretary of State and being, I'm also from New York, so I have a little uh, preference for that. But um, I like her, I, I just like her honesty, I think. Um, I think she's done a lot for women, just in general, just to make a, a women move forward. What has um, Marcus Rubio done for this country to make you want to vote for him? Um, he's, um, he comes from a Cuban immigrant family, and I like his, his story, his family story, and he served well in the, in the U.S. Senate. What w has Joe Biden done for this country to make you want to vote for him? Um, like I said, I think his foreign policy has been, um, the, he's been um, very out front on foreign aid, which I think is important, and also is really sensitive about um, overseas issues. And also health care reform. He's been very supportive. I'm very, um, in, very much in favor of everything that the Obama administration has done for health care reform. And uh, what do you think Jeb Bush has done for this country to make you want to consider him? I have to do a lot more research. It's, it's all early in the game. What has any of these people that I mentioned done for this country to make people want to vote for them? Um, Hillary, Jeb, and Donald Trump. Um, Hillary... Um, you know what, I think she kind of rides on the Clinton name. I mean, I thought her husband was a good president. That's my opinion. Um, Jeb Bush, again, he's going on the name. Um, he gets a lot of visibility because of his name, even though he just puts Jeb up on his uh, campaign signs. And, and <laughs> sorry, Donald Trump's just a joke. I mean, I can't even come up with anything serious about him. All right, and uh, do you believe that Obama and his administration lived up to the hype in his last two elections, and why? Absolutely not. You know, he was, he's a disappointment, a real disappointment. Um, I think the president has done a great job um, under extenuating circumstances. He inherited a lot of big problems, and I think he'll be judged very well by history for what he's done to bring the economy back and also um, to reform our health care system, expand um, health insurance. I think they did a lot. I think you can only, you know, do so much depending on what the Congress is at the time, but I, I think he's tried. No. Why is that? You know, what happened to hope? He talked about hope in his elections and he hasn't used the word hope since. I don't think any candidate ever lives up to the hype. Um, I think when we look back on it in history, they will have. They've done a lot. I think there's a lot of negativity that's clouding people's judgment about them, but um, I think they've done a lot for the economy. I know it, people might not feel like it, but compared to where we were, I think they've done a lot. So, for the most part, yes. What main problems do you think our next president should focus on? Well, I'd say ISIS is a pretty big deal right now. Um, I'd want to say that's the number one concern, but as an animal activist, I think the hunting 
and the poaching. We had the Lion Cecil die recently, and that was horrible. And I think that should be up there with some of the more important war issues that they deal with. I think animal conservation and protection is just as important. Their spirits. Um, I think we need to continue to um, focus on um, health care reform. I think we have a huge income gap. I think our education system needs a lot of improvement right now. Uh, we have to talk about the economy. We have to talk about education. Uh, we have to talk about saving our own resources. Concentrate more on our country rather than all oh, the Middle East, um, Israel, you know, outside issues. I think we have enough issues in our own country. Um, immigration is a big one. I think that should be a focus. And um, our and terrorism. Now, recently, U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island here, he stated that anybody that denies climate change should be arrested. Now, do you agree or disagree with that? I don't know about if they should be arrested, but it, if, I mean, it's definitely happening. <laughs> I think that people that deny climate t change are probably living in their own fairy tale. <laughs> but arrested is a little harsh. Um, maybe just they should take a look at reality. Well, that might be a little bit extreme. I, th I believe in free speech and freedom of opinion, but I think that the evidence is absolutely ironclad that climate change is real and we've got to do something about it. I think that's ridiculous. I mean, it's so obvious. All scientists have uh, proven that, so I, I can't even <laughs> imagine why anyone would say that. Disagree. Not, not arrested, um, but I think they're very um, misinformed if they don't believe that there is climate change. I disagree. Everyone should have their own opinion about everything. Be arrested, that's a little extreme. And, uh, do you believe there should be a mandatory carbon tax to cl combat climate change? I think there are enough taxes, but I would say that that would probably be one of the more important taxes. You know, we live in this earth and we already buy water. It would certainly suck if we had to buy fresh air, too. I don't know enough about it to say if there should be or shouldn't be at this point. Yes. Yes, I think um, the big factories and companies, they should be responsible for that, yeah. No. No. No, no more taxes, please, no more taxes. No, I don't. Now, the Rhode Island Department of Health just mandated that all students must be vaccinated before entering school this year. Do you agree or disagree? Well, I run the Rhode Island Public Health Institute, so I'm very much in favor of uh, mandatory vaccinations. The problem is, is that all of the, the claims that vaccines aren't effective or not grounded in any scientific evidence, vaccinating your kid is the best thing you can do for your child. At first, I probably had the same reaction as Jim Carrey, but if I was a mother and I was sending a healthy child to school and there was a child that wasn't so healthy, I would, I think the vaccination probably is a good idea now with all these unknown diseases and things that are in the world today and we want to keep our kids healthy. I agree. I think that it's preventative. <laughs> I think um, that's a good idea to do the vac most vaccinations uh, because we need to protect the students. Um, I agree on that fact because if kids are entering and they don't have vaccinations, they're putting other kids at jeopardy. I agree. To protect the, the other kids, to protect the population at large, yes, I do agree. I agree, but I, I do have some sympathy for the parents who think it's dangerous for their children. You know, I feel, I feel for them too, so I'm kind of a little bit torn on that issue. Do you think uh, this mandate undermines parental rights that allows the parent to decide what's best for their children? I know people probably think that, but you have to think of other people's children as well as your own, and so you have to think of the safety of the community. If parents don't agree with that, then they don't have to send their children to public school. Maybe under certain circumstances? Absolutely not. If you don't want to have the vaccinations, move to another country, um, send your child, uh, homeschool them, or find some type of alternative. But I don't think you should put my child at jeopardy because you're making decisions. Although I will say that I think that we do need to take a look at what's going into the vaccinations a lot more. I just found out this week that um, they're using the remains of um, ab aborted children in some of the vaccinations. No because it's, a, it's an entirely different issue. It's a health issue, it's a public health issue. Yeah, it does, it does. But, you know, I guess they feel it's for the safety of all. No, I think when you live in a, a government, in a society, you give up some of those rights for the good of society as a whole, and that's the best way for it to work. I think it would be fittingly to say, being that we're at 
a fairy festival that most Rhode Islanders are living in a political fairy tale to believe that Hillary Clinton would make a great president, but they quickly forget about Benghazi, and to believe that mandatory vaccines for their children are a good thing and they are safe. But what about parental rights? Unbelievable, wow, is my choice of words. Dan Bedondi, Infowars.com. So you're trying to lose weight and you think Diet Coke is better for you. Well, listen to how just one can can affect your body. Now, this was a UK pharmacist. He shocked fans by releasing this step-by-step -step guide showing how a sip of Diet Coke affects you from just 10 minutes to an hour later. So in the first 10 minutes, it tricks your taste buds and attacks your teeth. The phosphoric acid eats away at the enamel on your teeth while the artificial sweeteners like aspartame hit your system. Your body is preparing for the sugar overload, and so it causes your pancreas to release insulin. The insulin surge decreases the pancreas's sensitivity to insulin, so it puts you at risk of developing type 2 diabetes. <laughs> Perfect, great for losing weight. Now, the insulin triggers your body to store fat around the middle, and it increases your risk of developing heart disease. And since there is no sugar in Diet Coke, but now you have a lot of insulin running through your bloodstream, you basically tricked your body into thinking it's about to get some sugar, it starts pulling all of the available uh, blood sugar that you have into your cells. So then it leaves you with a massive sugar low, which of course, you're now needing sugar in your blood. So you start craving another Diet Coke and you go for something else like that because the combination of caffeine and aspartame creates a short addictive high similar in the way cocaine works. And basically it's never gonna quench your thirst because it dehydrates rather than hydrates your body. So a lack of vital water can lead to brain fog, poor concentration, fatigue, and feeling irritable so great but obviously coca-cola is such a powerful corporation that they can literally sell you something that is making you sick killing you making you fat giving you type 2 diabetes and it's not going to get yanked off the shelf and in fact they'll tell you go ahead and stick one in uh, for your kids but here's some other shocking news that i read today about another massive corporation this is the famous kellogg's brand now, I learned today that cornflakes were invented in the 19th century by John Harvey Kellogg uh, while he was working as a physician uh, in order to prevent people from pleasuring themselves. So he was working as a physician at Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan, and he developed these range of breakfasts that he thought would help stop people from masturbating. So Mr. Kellogg, he was very uncomfortable about sex. He believed it was unhealthy for the body, mind, and soul. He was celibate. He never consummated his marriage, and he kept a separate bedroom from his wife. He also chose adoption rather than impregnating his partner. Um, but he was, you know, while he was anti-sex, he considered masturbation even worse. And in his book, Plain Facts for Old and Young, Embracing the natu Natural History and Hygiene of Organic Life, he described 39 different symptoms which he said were caused by masturbation, including epilepsy, acne, bad posture, stiff joints, infirmity, poor development, fickleness and palpitations. And you'll have to look at the article to see some of the really sick things that he did to these poor people because he had a problem with <laughs> the natural part of, of life. Uh, but this is a doctor, okay? And now he's running this huge corporation which is in control, well, not anymore, I mean, he's dead now, but he's like running this huge corporation that's in control of your food. But nothing to worry about there, Kellogg, because according to experts, by 2070, Sex with robots is going to be the new norm. They say people are just going to fall in love with their virtual partners. And in fact, physical relationships will seem primitive. This is according to Dr. Driscoll. Uh, she said, we tend to think about issues such as virtual reality and robotic sex within the context of current norms. But if we think back to the social norms about sex that existed just 100 years ago, it's obvious that they have changed rapidly and radically. Well, I'll say we've gone from cornflakes to cyborgs. So when you read about things like this, it's, it's not difficult to answer that question. Why would they be poisoning the food? Why would they be poisoning the water? These are the type of people who are in control 
of those corporations that put all of these systems in place so long ago. Coca-Cola and Kellogg's are uh, just two of the 10 corporations that control almost everything you buy. So if you just take a look around that, those corporations, they're making us sick for profit. And of course, the old eugenics is always popping up as well. Uh, these are the people that are running our country and pushing for that total post-humanism. With many people fearing the disastrous results of MD-directed therapeutics, they had opted in favor of the more natural and results-driven homeopathic approach. In their bid for power, the allopaths came together and created the American Medical Association. It wasn't until the early 1900s, however, that the AMA got any traction. With the advent of new medical treatments, they received financial and political backing by powerful financiers who saw the profit potential in surgery, radiation, and synthetic drugs. In 1907, the AMA confided in the Carnegie Foundation to finance an in-depth study of medical education in America. Abraham Flexner, an educator in the employ of John D. Rockefeller, was hired to survey the country and compile data on every medical school. After five years of touring the nation, Flexner returned with his data in what is now known as the Flexner Report. What followed was the complete reformation in medical education. Many medical schools were forced to shut down, specifically all those that taught homeopathic medicine, as the practice was deemed scientifically invalid by Flexner. Schools that adhered to Flexner's standards and advocated synthetic drug treatments received millions of dollars in donations from the Carnegie and Rockefeller Foundations. And if you think that that is unbelievable, InfoWars has traveled to Valencia, Spain, uh, to the City of Arts and Sciences. It's an architecturally extravagant museum. And there they discovered this agenda uh, that's conditioning the public that eugenics and race cleansing is gonna help the population. Here is just a little bit of that video. This is one of the main tourist attractions in Spain. And on their website, it says, science, nature, and art, and a complex devoted to scientific and cultural dissemination in Europe, placed in Valencia. Inside the Museum of Prince Philip, I found many exhibits and promotions dedicated to the European Agency of Space, which is Europe's version of NASA. There's also a very large pendulum and a giant DNA helix. The second floor is devoted to the scientists who helped make a lot of our scientific discoveries in the 20th century. One of which is a placard dedicated to Bertrand Russell, a known eugenicist. His placard reads, Three simple but irresistible passions have governed my life. A longing for love, the searching for knowledge, and the unbearable pity for the suffering of humanity. That's right, Bertrand Russell cares so much about humanity, he also said this. Here is a clip from Endgame. Gradually, by selective breeding, the congenital differences between rulers and ruled will increase until they become almost different species. A revolt of the plebs would become as unthinkable as an organized insurrection of sheep against the practice of eating mutton. Bertrand Russell. H.G. Wells, Aldous Huxley, Bertrand Russell, and hundreds of other eugenicists constantly bragged about how the establishment believed themselves to be a separate, more advanced species than the common man. Top eugenicists were bold enough to admit that their real goal was not improving the heredity of the commoner, but to further dumb them down so that they could be more manageable. Nobel Prize winner Russell wrote at length about how vaccinations filled with mercury and other brain damaging compounds would induce partial chemical lobotomies and develop a servile zombie population. Diet, injections, and injunctions will combine from a very early age to produce the sort of character and the sort of beliefs that the authorities consider desirable. And any serious criticism of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. Bertrand Russell. And when I got to the third floor of the museum, I found its true dirty secret. It is set up to condition the public that genes and chromosomes are meant to be manipulated by scientists. Here you can see these large gene sequences depicted as a chromosome forest. These exhibits are meant to condition the public that science and scientists always have the public's best interest in heart. 
but if you look at the writings of Bertrand Russell, you will see it's completely opposite to freedom and liberty. So here in Valencia, people are being educated and conditioned that eugenicists have their best interest at heart. But slowly, the veneer of the elites is being lifted. Most people know that Planned Parenthood was founded by racist eugenicist Margaret Sanger. And you can watch that video in its entirety at the Alex Jones YouTube channel. That's it for the show tonight. Thank you for joining us.